Thank you very much. And first, I thank for the opportunity to be here and present the talk. And uh, I would like to present uh, a talk and s uh, selected a couple of examples to show some other alternative directions when we uh, simulate this quantum lattice model. So just in real space DMRG or, or uh, what we use for higher dimensional networks like trees or PEPs, but maybe there is some other a possibility if you make change of mode or change of basis, and this is something that I'd like to show you. So I will use some, some concepts that is familiar to all of us from physics, but I, I will use some vocabulary also inherited from quantum chemistry or nuclear structure theory. So if I say something that is not clear, then please stop me and, and, and ask me. Okay, I try to really use just the basic words, but this is a mixture of, of various, uh, let's say, subfields. And uh, my work is done in collaboration with uh, several colleagues from physics, math, chemistry, and then uh, at each places I try to include all the names. Okay, so. I will really just uh, spend one minute on, on just about tens of uh, product factorization just to see that what are, what are the basic concepts. Now I would like to show some kind of mappings to, to the Abinitio framework. Then the major part is this adaptive basis optimization, which uh, we adopt as once as Fermi's mode transformation. I will show some, some Hubbard-like examples. And then how is this related to these weakly and strongly correlated systems and how to push stronger correlations to basically disentangle the system in quantum chemistry. This is called single and multi-reference problems. Uh, there are something that is related uh, in technical uh, solutions that uh, I will describe it related to polarizations. And some hybrid methods that how to capture the static and dynamic correlations and be careful that dynamic in my talk doesn't mean time dependent stuff as, as for all of us, but in quantum chemistry it is called a, where you have uh, millions of small uh, correlations among several modes. This is what in chemistry called dynamic correlations and those correlations which are very strong about a few, let's say orbitals or modes or lattice size, this is what they call static correlations, but I will describe this in detail. And of course, hmm? Yes, uh, chemistry is that uh, when you have, a, let's say, a molecule and you have a lot of orbitals, and then those which are highly correlated, so in mutual information or in this entanglement, uh, let's say, related definitions, we see that whenever this, this mutual information or the, or the orbital entropies are large, these are the so-called static correlations, the strong correlations, and when you have, a, let's say, millions of small correlations, so because everything is correlated with everything, but the value is, let's say, 0 0.01 or 0 0.02, this is the small, so that if you put, let's say, if you plot the mutual information uh, values, uh, matrix elements in a decaying curve, then the parts, which are the large part, and then the major parts, which usually have an exponential decay, that's the static correlations, and once you have a very long tail, you know, which is extremely slowly decaying, that's what they call as the dynamic correlation. That's how it is. So I'm just trying to make this sure that don't mix it with the... Uh, okay, and then this adaptive mode transformation can be also used in time evolution, but I will just briefly mention um, just one slide. I don't want to go into details, but it's a very important thing is also that when we do this, the question is this basis. So that the excitation ranks and then how to make a truncation on the infinite basis because that's another truncation. So in this case, these are the two important things that will be uh, just a little bit explored. So just briefly that when we have a full tensor with as many legs, and this is what we, oops, uh, this is what we call the, as we all know, the physical legs, the alphas, and we just write on the wave function and gamma just relates one of the eigenstates. And of course, uh, this blows up exponentially because of course of dimensionality, so we need a kind of factorization. And so any high order tensors, and that's also important that in mathematics we call the order uh, as the legs of the tensor, and the ranks are the non-zero elements, also basically the size of the matrices and then the tensors, while in physics we call it, uh, the ranks usually the order, so it's, it's a little bit, uh, uh, there is this also uh, funny thing, but so at the moment, let's fix it that the ranks is really the sizes, so this, uh, and then the order is basically the number of the legs. So any high order tensor can be factorized as a product of low order tensors, as we all know, and here this is just a general example that there are tensors which has a physical leg and two virtual index, this has basically more like three, and then this has only a virtual index, has no physical legs, and then this, this uh, factorization is completely arbitrary. Now the question is, of course, how to choose the optimal tensor topology for a given system, and I will focus uh, later on only for the so-called uh, loop-free uh, versions, which for which the SVD can be applied directly. Okay, and uh, also the simplest form you all know is just uh, MPS, it's a product of matrices, it's a long history about all these developments, and uh, we also have this so-called gauge freedom, so this is not a unique representation, and I will use it this at one point later on. 
Okay, so let's focus on, on a general form of the Hamiltonian, which includes, uh, uh, let's say, the, the one-body and two-body interactions. Of course, you can go for three-body, four-body, but uh, as you know that already the two-body would scale with n to the fourth, which n is the system size, so that if you go for higher body interactions, of course, that would be the dent for DMRG or for this, this kind of uh, tensor network methods. So just la stop at, at this stage. Even here, we can describe most of the physics um, that, that we want to do. And of course, uh, this is the general scaling of the MPS. So it's M is uh, in the old fashion, this is the bond dimension. So in the old DMRG community, M was the number of block states. In the new uh, language, M is the D as the bond dimension. Now small D is the local dimension. So this basically uh, scales as M cube D cube. And of course, there is some storage and others in the renormalization step. Okay, you want to measure the different uh, properties of the eigenstates. Uh, you can also apply these abelian, non-abelian quantum numbers. If you go to, to the relativistic regimes, you can go for the so-called quaternion integral, uh, quaternion symmetries and, and many other things. Usually the size of these matrices uh, every year, I don't know, increase a lot. And then roughly speaking, some full spaces, we can correlate some seven electrons on seven or orbitals. Of course, some depending on the level of the entanglement and you have access to one body, two body, and so on, uh, density matrices, you can do finite temperature dynamics, and so on. Okay, so that the first time when, when this mode, the question of modes or the basis came is that uh, in DMRG was in 1996, where it was the introduction of the momentum space version, and there were some early work, works also from, from Reinhardt yeah, in 2002. We also worked on it, and of course, since then, there are a lot of works and also combinations like real space, momentum space, hybrid versions, and, and millions of things. But just keep it in mind that if you calculate the entropy of a single site and then you sum it up, you can get, this is the finest split, so that if you have a system and then you divide it into subsystems, you have a freedom how you want to partition the system into subsystems, and you can measure the correlations within the subsystems, and you can measure the correlations between the subsystems. So it's a, it's a, it has a correlations theory expressing all these details, but the finest split if you, if you just all subsystem includes just a single site, that would be the site entropy, and if you sum it up, this is what we call the total correlation, so that is basically the correlation that is encoded in the wave function. Now if you go to the real space, then, then for example, a half with Hubbard chain, you would, uh, for u equals zero, you would have just a uh, side degrees of freedom is four, like the zero, downspin, upspin, or the up downspin states. And of course you have n sides, so it's n times log four. But if you go to momentum space, it is just a product state and can be described just with a bond dimension d equal one. So here it's a piece of cake to do the calculation is already there, but here the DMRG of course, or this MPS has a hard time. If you increase u at some point, it's a crossover, and for the half width case, you go to log two in the real space case, while of course in the momentum space case, it gets worse and worse. So the idea is just would be great to find some kind of basis that comes out automatically that is optimized for the given problem. Okay, now in quantum chemistry, just, the, just in a picture of you, in this case, the orbitals are the, <clears throat> or the sites are the orbitals, so this is why we don't use sites and orbitals later on, but just use modes, because the modes are, can be anything. And just, uh, this is the DMRG, and of course, this can be combined with conventional methods. I will talk about this. You can also go to the relativistic regimes, then, then you can also have the Dirac solution, uh, a solution for the Dirac equations, for the spin or representations, and so on. Okay, some very interesting thing that I just take the liberty to show you two slides about these things, because that's what I'm spending now a lot of time to push DMRG to nuclear structure theory, because in nuclear structure theory, there is no method at the moment that can treat such a strong correlations in the system. So they have only some ab initio framework, but that's pretty much limited to, to light nucleus. Here the blue shows that what was the progress in calculating the different isotopes with the function of the neutron number and then the proton numbers and uh, how to how we are, uh, how far they managed to push, and this is the current limit, while this is completely unexplored, and this is what the DMRG or, M or TNS and all these methods can really make a big progress in the future. Here, it's again, have the same uh, Hamiltonian, but uh, now we have a complicated quantum number series because of also for isospins and, and the J quantum numbers and so on. Plus, we have three body interactions. So it's very important uh, to come up with something and this is what is a uh, uh, current work in 2022, that combination of this DMRG with the so-called uh, in-medium simulatory renormalization group, which they call as ISMRG. Just this is from field theory, just to do a kind of couplings and then push part of the three body interactions back to the two body. In this case, finally, you can end up with this two body interaction case and then you can do calculations. And just, just some exciting things that I can show you that 
uh, there is a double magic numbers in case of the lithium, uh, oh, I'm sorry, in the, in the uh, neon 28, that uh, double magic numbers means stable nucleus when there is a shell closing. Mm -hmm. No, it's actually sort of. <laughs> that's exactly the same. Quantum chemistry is easy because uh, you have some kind of chemical framework, you have your atomic basis states from that you form the, the molecular orbitals, and then there are many quantum chemistry programs that you can use and uh, generate these integrals. And in nuclear structure theory, this is already a big field how to generate this, and this is exactly what we are working together with Achim Schwenk from Darmstadt. And Achim is, is uh, I mean, his group is just the top, one of the top leaders in, in Europe uh, working on, on in this field theory, well, quantum chronology and all these things uh, comes into business. That how to generate these, these mathematics elements, and that many things come from experiments, from measurements that is built in. And there is a series of, of, of uh, in, uh, in the ISMRG, what they do, there is this kind of decoupling method, so that basically how to transform the three-body interactions, the parts of it back to the two-body, and there are a lot of things and things like that. So this is this is alone a very big field, and that's a very nice combination of these PNS methods with what they are doing, because now they end up with some, some Hamiltonian that is pretty much limited to small spaces, but if we do the DMRG or later on three PNS or whatever, then, then we can really push this limit. What is also important that again, if you measure this entropy, and you can show that what is the proton and neutron uh, uh, entanglement on correlation, and then you can show that at some point it takes a minimum shown by this, this uh, by the uh, the blue one, and this minimum is the one where the close uh, with where this shared closing happens, and this is what it uh, corresponds to this double magic number, and that was this re uh, discovered recently by experiments, and now there is a nice proof from. DMRG also, and last year there was a paper in Nature about this, but also DMRG has revealed a problem that there was some problem in the expansions, and so that we got the much better results. So anyway, I just well, wanted to course, you Can you repeat the logic? Because I always heard that, that people don't know what the Hamiltonian is, in, in, in the, so they do some experiments, they get some scattering phases, and what is the logic then, how you derive the Hamiltonian? That's a, that's a, I can tell you briefly, of course, uh, I'm also not an expert, it's Ahim, sir. Uh, Desk basically, but exactly so that what you do is the you make a, uh, this reordering of uh, the, the normal ordering of, of operators and you make some truncation rank at a given level so that basically there is a sequence of transformations and at some point they always make some truncation on the excitation ranks so that you have your harp, you have your harmonic graph basically or basically you have your, your uh, potential you know where you have your rivers harmonic oscillator states and the question is that how far how or where you make the cut. I thought they didn't know what the interactions were between the parts. Exactly, that, that, this is something, I, I don't want to say anything stupid, uh, okay, because that's, I'm also not an expert uh, in this, but so far uh, I think that many things come from measurements and also come from future approximations. What is the logic then? They do measurements and then they try to, mo to come up with a model that predicts things and if it fits, they say, I think, oh, yes, there is a back and forth, there is a back and forth calibration also. They are also calibrating all these parameters. So there is, there, is a, there is a large part which is related to experimental measurement, that's for sure. So it's not, as I said, it's not like a black box that you can, as a theorist, oh, here's a Dalton or MoPro or some quantum chemistry program package and play with it, you know, and then just got some integrals and then you can do your work. But uh, getting the integrals is really the big uh, uh, business. But I, well, let's, 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 uh, I'm, uh, maybe, I mean, I'm very happy to discuss all these, and maybe together I can, I can show you also some, some other details, and then we can go on around this. I just, well, I just wanted to say that this is really something that is really, I think it's, it's a hot topic, and I think this is going to be something important in the future, because it's really, this kind of field is really stuck as a given level because of the lack of, of, of uh, methods to do the large-scale calculations. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are we, um, so what is the current bottleneck? Is it uh, the numerics for simulating the Hamiltonian, or rather, Getting the Hamiltonian. So that, first of all, you have to uh, truncate the interactions, and the question is that uh, this so called this Emax value, what they have, that how far they go up in excitation ranks, and you know that uh, what they include, that's one truncation. It's like maybe you do quantum chemistry, we have infinite basis sets, and you make some truncations to some finite basis, and that's already a big, big uh, truncation in quantum chemistry. And this is what I will show you that MPS also allows us to make some uh, uh, proofs about the, how the basis. Uh, scales and approaches the infinite basis limit. And that's something, I will show you some, 
some work on that. So anyway, this that is, and then the second one is that once you have your Hamiltonian, you have to calculate it, and they have only these CI-based techniques. Then they take a reference state, make the one, one, one particular excitation, two particular excitations, so up, and then they make some truncation at the given level. And of course, there is a truncation on the, on the excitation ranks, and from this they want to make some extrapolation. But this is very bad because it's completely flux. There is no theory behind that, that, that there is no nice scaling. Well, in DMR, your MPS, you have the bond dimensions, you have the truncation errors and all these things, so that this is how you could come up. And this is what we have here, that these are all the DMRG results, the lines, the black ones are the experimental values, these are the calculated DMRG results, and for this nickel, which I just mentioned, uh, is a very important, this double magic number, that here we need even more DMRG states to, to converge, but I already kept some 10,000, and I also have some calculations for 15,000, but finally it's not included, but it's easily mass. And then a big uh, extension of this to make the non-abelian version working, which we have also the non-abelian code, but in the nuclear physics version, you need also for the spin three half, five half, eight half, nine half, thing, and all these things, which lead for long-range interactions. So it's a completely general code for, for long-range interactions for, 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 the, for the full non-abelian uh, framework. And that's basically part of our work, but it takes a lot of time, <laughs> a lot of efforts. But anyway, it's, I think it's, it's in the future, it's gonna be something, uh, I just wanted to, Make this. Okay, you can, we can also study some, some Hamiltonian where you have a lattice, you put some confined potential, and then you can do the real space calculations. That will be also a problematic because you have these short and long wavelength fluctuations. But if you make a change of basis and you go to the basis of the Hermite polynomes, in some uh, work you can have, for example, in 1D or 2D, you can express the, the interactions in very uh, nice compact way. Then you can study also very easily by this MPS DMRG these problems because it's going to be again just like in quantum chemistry, nuclear structure theory, that you have your oscillator states and you just start to fill it up with up to the number of particles and then you see the excitations. So, with this, uh, with limited uh, computation power, you can do the calculations. And there was some work together with an Israeli group from the Weizmann Institute where the Wigner crystallization in 1D has been confirmed also by DMRG with the same tricks. and. Uh, so it's uh, it's someone. So it's it's really important to make the this kind of change of basis. Or another example is, for example, if you have a nanotube which has some edges and some free atoms, there is you know these these edge spins, and then they of course uh, form these this, uh, in gap states in the non-interacting spectrum. And then if you switch on the interaction, then some will be the lowest uh, state will, will be related. The spin of this state will be the number of the edges. Uh, and then again, this is a complicated problem in real space, especially in 2D, especially if you wrap it around, then there are chiral symmetries and millions of things. But if you make again a change of basis and map it into the single uh, particle basis states, and then you express the Coulomb interactions also in the way you can have long range or whatever you want, you can express the same problem. And for example, uh, doing the DMRG in this, in this change of basis case, then you can, for example, see that what is the effective interactions between the edges, and then depending on whether the edge uh, has just one free atoms, then it's always an anti-fermion coupling. When there is, it's more than two, then uh, you have a fermionic to anti-fermionic uh, <coughs> uh, transition, so that you can tune these, these, these nanotubes also, and also you can change the dielectric constants, as many other things, so that basically this is a real, real simulations now for material properties as well. Okay, now, once we make this change of modes, then in the real space version, let's say everything is, all the entropies are, the site entropies are log two or log four. But once you make the change of basis, then you have different uh, entropies, so it's the modes are not equivalent anymore. So you need, first of all, some kind of uh, optimization that how you form your tensor topology. In the 1D case, it's like the permutation, so that you can change this mutual information. We just measure the correlations between site I and J for modes weighted with some distance, and here I just show you some example for some system where we had some original ordering, where you have these long range uh, correlations, and if you just reorder them, then you get this localized structure, and it, there is some theorem that if you calculate the so-called graph Laplacian, and you take the second diagram value of this graph Laplacian, it's so-called Fiedler vector that gives you a quasi-optimal ordering, which minimizes this graph envelope and cost function. Okay, so, if you change the tensor topology, then you can change the cost function. So going from DMRG to 3TNS or whatever, then this is this, the, the D function that you can play with. But that's it. So we have the ordering, we have the, the topology, but in order to change I, we need this change of modes. So this is exactly the next step. That if you want to change the I, then we need a change of modes. And this is a, already a work together with Valentin Morgan and, and Frank from 2010. 
that uh, if, you, if you just make also error to change of the mode, for example, by some gradient search, which in quantum chemistry also called this SCF, uh, the self-consistent field approximations, there is a way that you can go to, to a to new basis, of course, you can re-express your interactions just defining some unitary and so on. But this is very costly, and also the stability was found also sometimes not so uh, promising. Also, if you just make the rotations that you just calculate the reduced density matrix for the one particle uh, reduced density matrix, and then you just diagonalize it, you get the so-called natural orbital basis. If you do this kind of calculations, then also it's not stable. Okay, the other idea is that we make uh, just a change of basis in a way that if you have our MPS, and then we will just want to apply this GU, this global unitary, we can make it up from action of, of uh, unit, uh, these gates which acts only on two modes, so that as we sweep through the DMRG, we always apply some gates on two modes, but when we optimize the cost function, we calculate, for example, the block entropy, which now includes all the correlations, the many body correlations between the, the left and the right side, so that the gates are only on two modes, and if we do this, then we can sweep through back and forth and sum up all the components, so basically, the, the idea is that before DMRG, we just had this, this uh, uh, four index tensor that you split up with the SVD, and then you just got this AAJ plus one. Now what we do, we apply this GU, we, you get a new uh, Schmidt spectrum, and we compare the two Schmidt spectrum. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, after truncation, then we have these two Schmidt spectrum, and so that from that, you have to calculate some, some kind of cost function that tells you that whether the rotated or optimized modes are better than the original one. For this, we uh, introduce this half range entropy as we know that it's related to the MPS uh, on dimensions and so on. So the idea is that uh, if you do this kind of adaptive mode transformation that you can use this as a black box tool and you will end up with a, with a minimization that minimizes your, your cost function. And here I must be very specific because uh, uh, the mode transformations that we wrote the paper about is, that's basically mode optimization is based on the half range entropy. But if you use a different cost function, then of course you can get a completely different set of, of, uh, of bases. And that's what we are working on with Gero Physica from at the tomb with uh, my mathematician colleagues, that writing up this, this kind of optimization task in the general case uh, that, uh, so once you optimize the modes, you also have to define that what kind of cost function you use for this or what was the algorithm that you use. And of course, there are different modes for different uh, uh, topologies as well. Okay, so briefly. Hmm? Uh, feels that you're doing twice as high. The, the yeah. permutation of the modes is, is just a specific instance of a uh, yeah, permutation of modes is nothing. Transformation of, of the sides, that's nothing. But here we, he, here we rotate in the same way. So that what we do, <coughs> we you, you would expect if you do an optimal basis transformation that this includes the permutation of the. Yeah, that also includes exactly because if, if you have this, uh, I have, and someone we have this this Gaussian light so that you have this e to the power of you know this sine and cosine and stuff. So that if, and if theta is minus pi over two, then it's basically the swap gate. So why do you ha still have to do then the rearranging of the modes? Because it's not. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Why, why I have to do this? Okay, that's a good question. So. Because this is a local optimization procedure, so if I would, of course, run it for infinite many steps or sweeps, then you, you can uh, basically, in theory, generate all the permutations, okay? But uh, to speed up the calculations, it's much faster that you do maybe eight or ten sweeps, then you have these optimized modes, and then we make a global reordering based on this feedback vector and to kick out it from local minima. So it's like a simulated annealing that sometimes you kick it out and you let, let it relax. Because if you have a manifold which has a lot of local minima, you can get stuck at some place. And then if, if the global one is very far away, you know, you need a lot of iterations, but with this way, you can really speed up the calculations by order of 100 or even more. Okay? Mm -hmm. I didn't catch, what, this, what is this global reordering? The global reordering is which I wrote it here, this Fiddler vector, so that when I calculate the mutual information, all the correlations between I, I, J, and then I just like to repair you them in a way that I would like to uh, minimize some cost function, and here this cost function is this graph Laplacian. These are the things which we don't see in, 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 uh, in lattice models because all the lattice sites are, except in impurity problems, of course, where there is some, some kind of uh, uh, inhomogeneous distributions, but for homogeneous distribution, this doesn't mean anything. So this is really the, the case that, so that's, that's, this is the graph of Okay, This is what we call the global reordering. And that was a question of Frank that why was it needed? And this is basically, of course, just to speed up things. Wait, uh, hmm? can you write all these uh, uh, reordering as a, MPO is more motivation. 
Yeah, you can also play with that exactly. Remember what did it? Because, okay, so uh, I'm from this old DMRG community, and since I developed my code, I don't know, 25 years ago, and then it was written, I wrote all, I wrote all these things, explicit factorizations by hand. So I don't use the MPO language because I did everything. And so that I have explicit implementation in my code. I don't need any truncation on, on any criteria, whether something is zero or not, because it's already included. So, but you can of course play with this, and then the, I will tell you that how the bond dimension increases. Okay, that's an important thing, and that's okay. So, uh, okay, so we are here, and let's see that if you have a 2D model, uh, which is just a, a spinless Fermi model in, in 2D, the simplest case, you put it into PVC in both directions, so that we ended up with a torus. Of course, in DMR, it's a nightmare just to go up like in a snake or, or you know, in different versions. But if you use this mode, of, mode optimizations with some unitary, then you end up with this general form, just exactly what I studied for. And that's why it's a like an ab initio treatment. Of course, this ab initio is funny, but let's call it, this is like the ab initio treatment. So, and here is some, some examples. So let's take the 2D model on, on some, let's say, I think, I think this is on six by six or eight by eight uh, lattice. And these are the dashed lines are the ground state energies obtained by DMRG with um, different bond dimensions going up to 8,000, and so that you see these dashed lines. And then if you do the mode optimization with the bond dimension 64 only, you are already down here, which is much better than the one that you obtained with 512, or keeping 256, you are down here with the black one, which is much better than with 2048. So you can get much better uh, energies and of course wave functions after mode optimizations because the mode might be not the optimal one for, for this given problem. And so what you can do, you can do again the same thing. If you take the optimized, non-optimized modes and then do the scaling with one over D, this is the usual curve. In the optimized modes, you can get it's a much faster scaling, so it's much more robust and you can do uh, much better extrapolations. Okay, now you can also do, what you can do, you can also calculate the one and two particle reduced density matrices in the optimized modes. So anything that you calculate, you can back rotate it to the original basis because you keep these rotation matrices used, okay? So in the best basis, we calculate what we want, and then we back rotate this to the original basis, and therefore from these components, we can get up, uh, pick up what we want and construct the usual uh, order parameters, transition matrix elements, or whatever you want. So here I just show that uh, this is just the results for the bond order parameter in this 2D model, uh, scaling as a function of, of different interaction strengths from I think it's V equals Z, uh, 0 0.1 up to V equal 8, so that for V equal 8, of course, the bond order parameter is finite and so on. Okay, but what is behind all these things is basically the change of the block entropy. Mm -hmm. A previous slide, please. Yep. Um, if you compare the computational time, the bond time. Um, yep. I, let, me, let me say this in the next slide. Okay. I, will, I, will, I will include this. It's, it's much faster. So. I, I will show you something. the right basis first. Yes, 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 but I will, I will show you about the scaling uh, in the next slide. Okay. So in the original basis, you have your block entropy. For example, this is having a uh, six by six or eight by eight uh, uh, lattice. And then you switch on the mode transformation, the iteration one, two, three, and so on, and you end up with the optimized modes. And so this is what we call, call as the residual entropy. Because whenever you map a given quantum system to a network, you introduce a kind of artificial entanglement or correlations because you make this kind of partition of the system into different parts in the, in the network. But if you optimize the modes for the network, that what remains is the real physical correlations. So that's, that's basically, the, you generate quasar particles which interact with each other and that's the interactions that you can see. And this is exactly what happens in, the, in this uh, 2D model also because if you take U equals zero, then in real space you have this large block entropy value measured in the center, for example, but it's zero because you just have the momentum space solution. Now, if you go to the other limit, like large U, then you still have some finite entanglement in the real space version, but it is just zero because you have the determinant, which is the checkerboard. It's empty zero, empty zero in both directions. So it's one single determinant already describes you the whole system. And of course, in between, you can have a, a quasar particles which interact with each other, they generate some entanglement and so that you can see some peaks and then if you see the peaks, you know, as different system sizes, of course it can also scale. You can look for the maxima and then if the maxima which after some scaling scales to zero, then there is no real phase transition. While if you repeat the same calculations in one D case, then this peak remains at T equal uh, UV so that basically there is the quantum phase transition as we know. So that this immediately shows you that you can use this to measure and, and detect quantum phase transitions as well. Now, it's a big question uh, how this residual entropy scales, how it's related to area law and so on. 
So here, without going into too much detail, I just say that if you measure this block entropy for uh, different optimized modes with different bond dimensions, you can show that it also saturates, so there is some kind of a scaling law, but I don't want to go into to too much detail at the moment. It's part of our work also. I don't and so now that you can also do, of course, for other, other networks, you can go to 3TNS and so on, in which case the mode picture will be different because you have a completely different network topology, so you have to optimize the modes for that topology. And that's completely, as a black box tool, it's completely uh, up to you what you want to do. Okay, so there are many other applications for impurity problems. We also had for these graphene nanoribbons, Wigner crystals, and so on. And uh, what you can also do is that this is the, mo for example, the site entropy is the modes in the original lattice where it's just a PBC in both directions. This small fluctuation is just the numerical noise. And after mode transformation, you get this kind of different mode uh, structures. And of course, you can see the change from 0 0.5, it goes down to 0 0.02. So this is much less, uh, it's like far more weakly correlated than in the original problem. What is important is that you can measure also the occupation numbers along your system and also the eigenvalues of the bond particle reduced density matrix. And then if you just put them in a decreasing order, they can fall on the top of each other. This means that you form the so-called natural orbital basis. So this is by automatically. So because if you talk to quantum chemists, they say, here is your problem. And then there is some integral set in the natural orbital basis. And I never understood that how they can provide me a natural orbital basis without solving the problem. And then it just turned out it's a natural orbital basis up to some approximations that they use. So that they use some kind of methods up to some excitation ranks, and then they provide you some kind of a natural orbital basis up to something. But here, this method automatically gets you the best basis. If this is not the case, so that they do not fall on the top of each other, as we have many examples, then the, uh, we also found some kind of other basis, which was the optimal one. Hmm? Yeah, but you would expect that this is a Slater determinant, no? Exactly. So you don't need any entanglement at all. Exactly. Here, it's basically, it's a product, it goes down to almost a product state. So if it's, if it's just ones and zeros. Exactly. So why do you need... That's a network then Because at all. here, here uh, you don't see there is a deviation of 10 to the minus 2, just exactly what you can see here. It's, it's hard, you cannot see it here. In this example, I just showed you that it basically comes from a situation. So I can show you also some case where this is going to be the, the final result, for example. You see here, there is no jump. So this that is the means that, that with hard refoc, you would also have found that solution, no? Um, exactly. So that's exactly what, in this, once you make this mapping, that this is going to be the fun part. We need only this part to describe by DMRG, and we don't need that and that one, which is already close to ones and zeros, you know, because these are almost occupied or empty orbitals. Does that mean that, that the way you do it is first do hard refoc and then work with that basis? No, I'm just saying that in certain cases you can get back a, a very large component which is related to hard refoc and all the correlations be beyond hard refoc. You see, if you have just a hard refoc solution, that would be just ones and zeros. And all the correlations which goes on the top of it, this is going to be just, you know, and then in a critical model, of course, they get uh, touched to each other, and then you have, you know, like in, in common agalatigia liquid, of course, it's a continuous curve and all these things. So, but whenever you have a Fermi gap, of course, you can still have this. Okay, so, of course, for, for Hubbard model, you can do the same. Marsh, huh? I'm going to ask again. Uh, you promised me to show uh, <laughs> times. Let me, let, me, let me show you. <laughs> this is okay. then let's jump here, because this is what you asked. Okay. So, running the DMRG with 8,000 states, uh, I don't know, it took me uh, several hours on the 6x6 on the six six lattice. Of course, it depends on what processor you use or uh, what is the parallelization. Once you do this mode optimization with 64 states, I think it took some 10 minutes. And then the final computation time in the optimized basis that usually uh, drops by a factor of 10 compared to the original problem. It's a question that the 64 the, op the optimized basis with 64 states, how good is it? So how far is it from the final results? And then you have seen this saturation of the curve, which I have shown you, you know, so that this is why I have shown this, uh, uh, that how it scales. So if you start too early, you still gain, but maybe not as much as if you would do this. So that we are, there is a need still, you know, in, in terms of rigorous mathematics as well, or also from computational side to write a kind of heuristic algorithms which can determine, you know, what is the, best uh, adaptive scaling parameters, you know, for mode optimizations and for the final calculation. But there is, a, there is a, almost a factor of 10 reduction in, in speed. And uh, as the cheating, of, uh, not, to, not to make any cheating, and that's why I think it's very important, that 
Uh, first of all, we have this Hamiltonian which scales as n to the fourth. But once you make this change of basis, then it's going to scale as n to the square. That's what's the original uh, work from Chen. And uh, in a lattice model with long range interactions, we already have something n square, which can be again this so called this uh, pre summation of operators to do uh, use the scaling back to n. Now, if we have this MPS uh, uh, structure for a localized Hamiltonian, and then you go to this ab initio framework, you increase your bond dimension. So that's the natural question that you are asking, that of course it looks very nice because in the bond dimension we make, made a factor of 10, 100, or 1,000 drop, but how does it uh, work because the bond dimension you know, increased in it maybe a factor of 10 or even more, okay? And that's true because you increase the, the bond dimension, but this is exactly when you have to take into account uh, all the IP solutions of, of how what's all this tremendous progress in, in computational power, because if you can reduce the memory uh, consumption, but you can factorize all these new terms over loops, over sectors, over independent terms in the Hamiltonian, and uh, you put all these things together, you can have your MPI code, and then this kind of uh, extra cost that you pay because your MPO increased in real computational time, you can recover it by this full MPI parallelization. Okay, so that of course, the computational time of the total CPU time, we also increase or decrease. This depends on how much you gain uh, by reducing the bond dimension and how much you lose because your MPU bond dimension increase. That's one thing. But the second one can be compensated with, with very sophisticated MPI uh, codes on, on HPC superclusters. And since the number of cores increases more than the amount of memory in these uh, HPCs, I think this is exactly the case what, what we really have to push things. Okay. We have like four more minutes or so. Okay, then I skip. Uh, let's come back because then, uh, oops. Here, this is just on the condo problem, for example, where you take the condo model in the original basis. If you, if you extract the, from the MDS wave function the full uh, tensor uh, coefficients, which we call as the CI coefficients, this is just in the original basis. But if you go to the mode optimization, you get see that it drops very quickly. And what happens is that you have your impurity and the path, and after more transformation, you get the impurity uh, connected with the upspin, with the downspin of this renormalized or this recorrected optimized modes from the path and from the other ones, so that you can describe the same problem again with much less parameters. And so what you can do also if you sum up these coefficients, it should be one in the wave function. And this is just an example from quantum chemistry where you take the N to nitrogen dimer and you just stretch it. This is just a simple toy system to show a single and multi-reference current so this uh, weak or strong correlations. Then as we stretch it, you get this sum uh, much uh, slower, so you need la la more and more components. But if you go to this mode optimization, then you can see that the black one, which you needed a very slow uh, increase, it's already up here, so that a few components uh, uh, or it gets large weights, and then the rest uh, goes up to one very quickly. So this means this kind of multi-reference correlation, so that when you need a lot of excitations to not just single, double, but triple, and so on, can be really reduced and compressed in a way that you your calculations up to single, double levels already provides you uh, the sum of the uh, square of the weight function coefficients up to 99 uh, degrees. So this is just an example, also a demonstration, and so that was the answer to your question also about parallelization that you can put it on the GPUs and CPUs. And the very last bit I'd like to show you, tell you because it's important is that there were previously models that uh, DM margin is very good, but it's a local optimization. And if you have these long range interactions and you need millions of, a lot of sweeps going back and forth. So there was the idea that we take the full space, we just take a small part, which is the most correlated, we just select this, we solve it by DMRG, and from here, we sample some kind of coefficients, and this is what uh, uh, in quantum chemistry causes a couple cluster theory, which is another wave function parameterization. So it's a hybrid method that from DMRG, you can hook up these parameters and put it into the couple cluster. But uh, there's a lot of problems mathematically, it's easily defined, and uh, we are playing with this for almost five years, but quite recently, Finally, there is a solution that if you use your DMRG and you couple it to a space where you don't have all the excitations, but maybe just two electrons which are distributed, you can measure this kind of dynamic correlation so that it's more important to go up to very high energy states and allow some electrons to hop to very high energy states than have a very exact uh, accurate solution on a much smaller space. And if you do this, 
then basically you can re reproduce all these quantum chemistry uh, results with this so-called restricted active space uh, DMR G up to single double excitations. And so now I think we are in the stage that beta of this DMR G rush is, uh, is really an embedding method. Then there is a nice uh, compact mathematical way, and so that we have some paper together with, with Gero Krizika soon out, which shows you that there is a very uh, important error scaling that you can prove uh, from mass and then also do some kind of extrapolations. And so this we can skip. And I think just graphically, if you have an MPS and then if you truncate it back to a finite dimension without going into the math part, you can always define a closure vector which projects out only a finite basis on the Fox space and then the rest of the environment can be decoupled and this can be obtained by some series of case transformations. So by briefly, if you take a system and then you just select one component out of, the, of, the, of your full basis and then you measure the Schmitt spectrum at this cut and then you allow the basis size to increase up to infinity, so longer and longer, you can see that how the Schmitt spectrum scales for this distance cut and then it will just uh, saturate. So you can also use this tool to measure that how good your basis. So in conclusion, we make the mapping of the original problem to this kind of ab initio framework, where as Frank Corey pointed out, you have this narrow range around the Fermi surface. It's a question that how correlated your system is, because if it's just uncorrelated, then you have just a Hartree-Fock solution. If it's correlated, of course, you have you know, this kind of deviation from the occupied and from the empty. And you can focus on that part and increasing the basis size. Uh, you can also decide that how far you have to go up to a given accuracy limit. And uh, here I just finish my talk. Thank you very much for your attention.